All right, this is kind of a long lecture, but it's a really important one. We're talking about how you can see really small stuff. In other words, the characterization of nanomaterials. And throughout this slideshow, you're going to see a bunch of pictures that are SEM images of common household items. And if you were in class, you were supposed to play a guessing game with a word bank. Um, if you're just watching this at home, um, you can try and guess for fun, but you don't have the word bank, so it might be a little more difficult. At the end of these notes, there is an answer key, so at least you can figure out what you were looking at. So here's an example of number one. So I'm going to skip over these a little more quickly as I go through this lecture, because it is a fairly long lecture. All right, so you want to see something that's down at the nanometer range. What do you need? You need an instrument that has extreme sensitivity, accuracy, and atomic level resolution, meaning that you'll be able to decipher between atoms. So there's lots of different techniques to use to look at the structure of something. You can use a scanning electron microscope, a transmission electron microscope, x-ray diffraction, there are several scanning probe microscopes, one being an AFM, and then also you can figure out what exact elements are in your sample using chemical characterization, so uh, optical spectroscopy or electron spectroscopy. So first, let's talk a little bit about x-ray diffraction. So this is something that's used for crystalline structures. Um, what you can do is you can basically shoot x-rays at a sample from all different angles and depending on how those x-rays are scattered that tells you about how the atoms are arranged. There are also lots of techniques that are already being used for the surfaces of material like electron microscopes and scanning probe microscopes. Alright, so electron microscopes, what can they tell you? They can tell you about the morphology of a surface, which is talking about its size and shape, the topography. Imagine one of those maps that's like 3D that comes out of the wall um, that tells you where the, the high altitude mountain ranges are versus the, versus the valleys. You can do that with your samples too. You can uh, find out more about how what the texture of a surface is like, how rough it is, how hard it is. That's the topography. You can also learn about crystallography, how the atoms are organized, another technique um, besides the x-ray diffraction. All right, so you may already know this, but crystals have atoms that are very ordered in what are called ordered lattices. Amorphous is just the opposite. It means without shape. There's no ordering of atoms. And as you can imagine, crystallography affects properties. It changes things like the melting point or the boiling point, how things react. So it's important to study and understand. All right, so what about light microscopes? These magnify things from 500 to 1500 times their size. And you can get to a resolution of about 0.2 microns. The limits were reached by the early 1930s. And that's because the wavelength of light is, uh, violet light is around 400 nanometers. And the rule is it's kind of wavelength of the light or whatever you're working with divided by two, that that's what you can decipher. So the resolution would be around 200 nanometers. That's the same as 0.2 microns. So you can't really use a light microscope to study something that's smaller than 200 nanometers. So we need to use an electron microscope. This is a little bit different. It involves a beam of electrons instead of light. And the big examples are transmission electron microscopes, or TEM, and scanning electron microscopes, SEM. All right, so how do electron microscopes work? First, there's a stream or a beam of electrons that's formed by a, some sort of a source and they are accelerated or aimed at your specimen. Those electrons are focused into a thin beam, which is focused onto your sample, and these electrons actually interact with your sample. And based on the interactions, 
those effects are detected and an image is formed. Here's some pictures. We'll go into some um, details about some other pictures in a, in a minute here. But a little bit more about the electron beam. The coils that accelerate and focus are uh, called deflection coils. And we're talking about 200 to a million electron volts here. It's a very important that for TEM, your sample needs to be conductive, of course, so that electrons are conducted through your sample, and it needs to be very thin. Because in transmission electron microscopes, electrons actually go through your sample, hence the word transmission. In a scanning electron microscope, you can basically put almost anything underneath it. You just need to make sure it's conductive. Now you might say to yourself, okay, I see like butterfly wings and things like that under uh, electron microscopes all the time. Well, they basically sputter coat those biological items with gold um, so that they become conductive and you can use, then you can put them under the electron microscope. So again, how things are detected in transmission electron microscopy, the transmitted electrons are detected while in scanning electron microscopes, the emitted electrons are detected. So the wavelength of electrons is a lot smaller than the wavelength of visible light. So as you can imagine, you can have a much greater resolution or a much smaller resolution. And really this depends on the size of the electrons, their charge, and the what you're using to accelerate those electrons. Alright, let's talk about a transmission electron microscope. So here's an optical microscope showing that you've got lenses above and below your sample that are focusing light onto your sample. And TEM, they have like a little coil looking thing here. This is your electron source and these are those deflection coils that are focusing the electrons onto your specimen. Your specimen would be very thin right here and the electrons that are transmitted or that go right through your sample are the ones that are detected. This is impressive. TEMs magnify 50 to 1 million times the size of your sample. Remember that, that difference from a light microscope. I've got a little animation too of a TEM. So here, these are the electrons that are being focused and um, they go through the sample right here. They're showing like your specimen has some uh, holes right here and so they go through, refocused, and then this is where they're imaged. You can change the voltage and see how you change the speed of those waves coming in. All right, scanning electron microscopy. So the magnification is not as high for an SEM. Works a little bit differently. Again, the advantage here is your sample doesn't have to be so thin. So here's the electron coil again. Electrons are focused onto your sample and then electrons that are scattered or emitted are detected here. So this is a lot different from having the detector at the bottom with the TEM. We're going to look at a little bit of a longer tutorial for this. And again, I didn't show this up there, but the emitted electrons or photons are detected. So we're going to watch some animations with the scanning electron microscope. A scanning electron microscope is about the size of a large desk. The column is to the right, extending above the specimen chamber, on the front of which can be seen the external stage controls. All of these components rest on a vibration isolation table, built over a cabinet full of vacuum valves, plumbing, switches, and an oil diffusion pump. Behind and to the left of the column, above it, the cylindrical liquid nitrogen doer for the X-ray analysis system can be seen. The back of the secondary electron detector a rectangular box angling just above the specimen chamber is to the left, and one of the backscattered electron detectors projects horizontally out of the specimen chamber to the right. <laughs> 
Almost all of the controls for the microscope are available via the computer, accessible through the monitor and keyboard. Computer control is what makes this microscope remotely accessible. The microscope has its own filtered electrical power, with mains matching transformers and a high tension tank that produces up to 30,000 volts, a closed water system or chiller to cool the electromagnetic lenses, dry nitrogen gas backfill, pressurized air to control the valves, and rotary vacuum pumps. It's networked and runs 24 hours a day. The sample is placed inside the sealed chamber of the electron microscope, which must be pumped to a relatively good vacuum before we can turn our primary electron beam on. Air molecules anywhere inside the electron microscope could be collided with, sending the electrons far off course. Collisions with air molecules are unacceptable when trying to maintain reliable image sharpness and minimize noise each time the microscope is used. This image is of the inside of the electron microscope. It is taken by a small CCD video camera and illuminated using infrared light. The camera is necessary to verify that movable components on the stage won't impact the column or chamber when the door is opened and closed. It is invaluable when attempting sophisticated orientations or using complex apparatus like the Peltier cold stage where it may be important to see the sample as the vacuum pumps down. With this camera, we can see the pole piece out of which the primary electron beam comes. Directly below it is the sample stage which has five axes of motion, although tilt is not yet computer controlled. When we use the scanning electron microscope to image a specimen, we are directing high energy electrons, the electron beam, at the specimen in an ordered pattern, left to right, line by line, in a repeating rectangular array. The high energy electrons, which may also be termed primary electrons, cause secondary electrons to be ejected from atoms at or near the surface of the specimen. Some of these secondary electrons, at least a thousand times less energetic than the primary electrons, are collected using a secondary electron detector, or SED. The SED has a metal cage at its entryway with a 300 volt positive bias on it that attracts the secondary electrons. The cage, also called a Faraday cage, can bend the paths of secondary electrons in the direction of the SED so that they travel through the Faraday cage towards the collection target of the detector. The analog signal being produced by the SED in real time is sampled by an analog to digital converter and synchronized to the position of the primary beam along its raster path. The computer converts the digitized analog signal into pixels of varying grade level, one by one, left to right, line by line in concert with the movement of the electron beam across the sample. Thus, we never take an instantaneous snapshot of our field of view as with a CCD but rather must build the image pixel by pixel over the time it takes for the primary beam to raster over our entire field of view. Magnification is achieved by simply making the field of view, the rectangular area over which the beam travels, smaller. A scan area 1 micron wide will result in an image 10 times more magnified than a scan area 10 microns wide. Magnification is just one way in which the techniques of light microscopy and scanning electron microscopy are completely different. As a reference, atoms range in diameter from 1 to 3 angstroms, and there are 10 angstroms per nanometer. So in the space of 2 nanometers, there could be from 6 to 20 atoms. Even though our beam can be reduced to a diameter of only a few nanometers, we must take into account sample penetration when we discuss how small of features we expect to resolve. Sample penetration is not just important to resolution. It also causes unexpected phenomena such as edge effect and many other less frequent phenomena in all modes of imaging. Most of the secondary electron signal that we see in secondary electron mode comes from type 1 secondary electrons, which escape only near the surface where the primary beam strikes. Backscattered electrons, however, may bounce back from even further inside the sample. X-rays, typically created by backscattered electrons that never made it back out of the sample, are known to come from the deepest areas of beam interaction. Secondary electrons may be generated at all depths of beam interaction. However, their weak nature causes all but those occurring near the surface to be recaptured by the sample 
before they are able to escape. Secondary electrons come from the surface and very near the surface of the specimen, and thus the secondary electron image represents mostly topographical information. If the specimen is tilted towards the secondary electron detector, the signal will be much stronger and the image much brighter. This is something we often forget because the signal obtained using a field emission electron on gun is usually more than adequate. Secondary electrons come from the surface and very near the surface of the specimen, and thus the secondary electron image represents most... Okay. A scanning electron microscope Oops. is about the size of a large... We do not want to watch that again. All right. So you've got the SEM basics down. Let's talk a little bit more about the electron beam interactions with individual atoms. Okay, so you probably remember that atoms have a nucleus and that there are core electrons within the valence electron shells. So something that can happen is basically one of those electrons from the beam knocks out one of the valence electrons. That happens a lot. Those are called secondary electrons. If a beam comes in and hits the nucleus, that's called backscattering. And what's most interesting is if a core electron is knocked out because now you've got a valence electron that's going to want to come down and fill that empty hole where the core electron was. And so that energy difference there is going to release an X-ray photon or something called an OJ electron. Here's kind of a better picture of that. So an electron hits an atom and ejects one of the core electrons. Here it is. This is getting knocked out. So now one of the electrons that was right here wants to fill that. So it's going to relax to the ground state. Now that energy difference between the two releases or releases an X-ray or an OJ electron. And we can detect that based on what happens. So the for short, they're called EDS and AES. And what's really cool is because of the distances between shells, um, because they're unique for every element, the amount of energy that's released tells us exactly what kind of element is present in that sample. So again, the emitted energy is characteristic of a specific type of atom because every atom has its own unique electronic structure. So the AES, the OJ electron spectroscopy, is used um, best with surface analytical, um, as a surface analytical technique. So when you're going less than a nanometer and a half deep, it can detect almost all elements versus EDS only detects elements that have a Z greater than 11. What does that mean? That's the atomic number greater than 11, sodium. EDS can also perform quantitative chemical analysis, meaning you can figure out exactly how much of something is in your sample. So let's compare SEM and TEM. SEM makes clearer images than TEM. It's easier to prepare a sample for, but TEM has a greater magnification than SEM. SEM has a large depth of field, meaning you can see a lot at once of your picture, and SEM is easily paired with other detectors, like the EDS or the AES. There are a couple example images. We've seen quite a few. So I mentioned a little bit about actually figuring out what kind of chemicals are present. I want to talk about um, optical spectroscopy. You might have heard of infrared spectroscopy or Raman spectroscopy or photoluminescence. Um, they have all these fancy letters for short. Um, I took a class in college where basically we studied, um, I think it was called instrument analysis. We studied all of these different instruments and practiced using them. And anyways, it takes a very long time to understand how each of these instruments works. Um, and that's beyond the scope of this course, but it's good to know that there are instruments out there that can tell you a lot about 
um, what your sample looks like at the chemical level. And I've already mentioned um, using EDS and AES to tell you about your sample. A couple uh, terms here. Absorbance is what happens when an electron gets excited and it moves from the ground state to one of the outer shells, the excited state. Emission is a term that refers to an electron relaxing from its excited state back down to the ground state. And transmittance is a term that means the opposite of absorbance. Radiation only penetrates about 50 nanometers deep into a sample. It's difficult for it to get past to get past that. All right, so we're switching gears. We're talking about SPM, scanning probe microscopy, and it's literally a probe that scans across the surface. So there's two types that um, we talk about, AFM and STM. This type of microscopy is all about measuring forces. Depending on the tip that you're using, you can measure electrostatic forces, so that's pluses and minuses, magnetic forces, thermal microscopy, and capacitance micros microscopy. So let's talk about scanning tunneling microscopes first. This was developed in 1982, and the concept of tunneling is really um, interesting because basically what it is is you've got a tip um, usually made of tungsten and you've got your sample underneath it. I should have a picture here and it depends on how close your tip is to your sample um, because if you decrease the distance even one nanometer smaller tunneling increases by ten times and what tunneling is, is when an electron basically appears on the other side. So an electron moves. You need a very sharp tip that's conductive. It's usually mounted on a stage. It's typically kept between 0.2 and 0.6 nanometers from the surface. And there's a current that's measured. A current is the flow of electrons. very very small resolution. Here's a picture of a tungsten tip. Alright, so there's some different ways you can use scanning tunneling microscopy. You can use a constant current mode. Basically you keep the tip um, at different distances because you want it'll automatically adjust the height to keep the tunneling current the same. It involves the feedback mechanism and the height is measured at each point. Or you can use constant height mode. This one's easier to picture because basically your tip stays at the same height across, uh, moving across your sample and based on how much tunneling is happening you can tell how close the, um, the sample is to your tip. You can imagine this would tell you a lot about the topography of your sample. And then finally, atomic force microscopy. It's great because you can use it for pretty much anything. You don't even have to sputter coat it. It measures very small distances. It involves van der Waals interactions, so electrostatic forces. You can um, use it to measure magnetic interactions capillary forces, so the condensation of water between the sample and the tip. And atomic force microscopy is really cool. Basically, there's going to be a cantilever that scans across the surface. And you have a laser that's very focused, and apparently it's very difficult to get it focused right in the spot that you want it. And there's something that measures the deflection of the laser as it moves across the surface. So we're going to go back to the animation for AFM. It's the height of the surface. Scanning tunneling microscopy was the first scanning probe technique developed by Binning and Royer in 1982. Atomic force microscopy is the most commonly used scanning probe technique. Capping mode microscopy, magnetic force microscopy, electric force microscopy, 
frictional force microscopy and near field optical microscopy are a few examples of the long list of scanning probe techniques in use today. Scanning probe microscopy refers to a group of imaging techniques that collect images of a sample surface by moving a probe over that surface in a raster pattern. As the sample moves, all scanning probe techniques have a small probe, a feedback method, and fine control of the distance between the tip and the sample surface. Various methods are used to send a signal to the feedback. The feedback control assesses the distance between the tip and the sample. If the distance is too small, the feedback loop signals the piezo crystal mounted at the base of the sample to contract, lowering the sample. If the distance is too large, the feedback loop signals the piezo crystal to expand, raising the sample. An image of the sample is created by plotting its horizontal and vertical movements as the tip scans across its surface. An image of the feedback signal is also produced. This indicates how well the feedback loop is controlling the tip sample interaction. A scanning tunneling microscope consists of a conductive metal tip positioned approximately 10 angstroms from a conductive surface. An electrical potential of 10 to 40 millivolts is placed between the tip and the sample. This creates a conductor, insulator, conductor structure with an insulator thickness of 10 angstroms. Quantum mechanics predicts that a small number of electrons will tunnel through a short barrier. The number of electrons, or the tunneling current, is related to the barrier thickness. When the barrier thickness is less than 10 angstroms, the number of tunneling electrons increases, strengthening the tunneling current. When the barrier thickness is greater than 10 angstroms, the number of tunneling electrons decreases, weakening the tunneling current. A constant current STM image is created by scanning the STM tip over the surface while keeping the tunneling current, and therefore the tip sample distance, constant. The tunneling current is monitored by a feedback loop. The feedback keeps the tunneling current constant by raising and lowering the sample stage, which in turn keeps the distance between the tip and the sample constant at 10 angstroms. The topography image is a plot of the movement of the sample up and down under the tip, while the current image results from plotting the actual tunneling current. Atomic force microscopy uses a silicon nitride tip mounted on the end of a silicon cantilever spring. Feedback is based on a change in force between the tip and the sample, which changes the angle of the cantilever and moves the spring. A laser reflecting off of the back of the tip moves up and down on a detour as the spring moves. The feedback loop reacts to a change in laser position by adjusting the height of the sample in order to keep the force constant. The topography image is created from the path of the sample moving up and down, while the deflection image is based on the deflection of the tip. The AFM operator adjusts the feedback controls to minimize the deflection of the tip. Okay, so just to do a little recap here, that did a great job showing how you can use STM or AFM. There are other uh, tip surface force microscopes as well, and all of these are great for imaging your surfaces, for measuring the uh, chemical and physical properties of your surfaces. Uh, you can also use some of these to make or process nanostructures or nano devices. So in summary, there are a lot of techniques that you can use to study nanostructures. There are bulk characterization techniques, or there are also surface characterization techniques. Alright, and now for the fun, let's figure out what all these pictures were. That was the mosquito eye, that was salt and pepper, a deer tick head, the foot of a house fly, a porcupine quill, the tip of a dentist drill, toilet paper, Velcro, a staple in paper, scratch and sniff paper, needle and thread, a toothbrush, a used Q-tip, dust that has added color because SEM images are only black and white and gray, that's used dental floss, human eyelashes, instant coffee granules, a butterfly wing, red blood cells and a virus, two viruses, and that is it. Woohoo! You made it through the longest nano